Good morning. morning. Y'all get a good night's sleep? Okay, we're going to have a little fun now. A song of songs of Solomon. He kisses me with the kisses of his mouth, for his affections are more delightful than wine. That is, he kisses me with the kisses of his mouth. So I'd like you to say it with me a few times. Yishakeni minshikot pihu. Yishakeni minshikot pihu. This is fun. One more time. Yishakeni minshikot pihu. Brody, how much time do I have left? Okay, we're going to do it one more time, and I really want you to concentrate and focus and think about what your lips are doing as you say it. Okay? And I want you to hold on to that last syllable. Yishakeni minshikot pihu. Okay, if you're like me, that last syllable, hu, your lips are ready to give a kiss. And that's the magic of Hebrew, I think. Um, it's just a very, I think it's a very sweet way to start the morning. What does it have to do with what we're going to talk about, the altar and man? Maybe absolutely nothing, or maybe absolutely everything, but uh, you can decide that. Today, last night we talked about sacred space, what God had to put into the equation, and today we're talking about man and the altar. Like Hillel said uh, concerning his talks, there'll be some uh, overlap, because after all, last night we talked about what, man brought, what God brought to the table, and now we're going to talk about man's reaction to that. So again, God created the world for one purpose, and that was to have a place in which he and man could share space and be together. And so toward that purpose, God created the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden, and put man in it. So the Garden of Eden was basically the completion of creation, it was basically the, the tent of meeting because there God and man would be together and live happily ever after. In fact, the Gan Eden, Garden of Eden in, in Hebrew, and Ol Moed, which is the tent of meeting, sort of are parallel phrases. Gan is a garden, it's a shaded protected area. The Ohel of Ol Moed is a tent, which is a shaded protected area. And the word Eden and Moed, although they have, both have different meanings, they share the aspect of time. And Edan in Hebrew is an era of time. So basically, the Garden of Eden, as was the Tent of Meeting, was a place of time. Or maybe it was a time of place. But in any case, that's where God and man could be together. And God said to man, you will tend to the garden and care for the garden. So basically, God has appointed Adam as the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. This is what he does. He tends to the garden. He makes sure that things are good. And then God throws a little wrench into the works, and he says, just don't eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Now, I don't know, when you were a kid, did anybody ever tell you not to put beans in your ears? <laughs> I mean, the only reason kids put beans in their ears is because someone says don't. So God must have known that by saying don't do this, that man would definitely be tempted to do it. But then God does something else, which to me is really curious. Immediately after God says to man, don't eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helpmate for man to be, to be along, alongside him. So where did that come from? What wasn't good for man to be alone? Man didn't complain. Man was happy. Man was content. He lived in his great place. He was doing what he wanted to do. He had no worries. And where did, where did no, not good, lotov, everything else up to now has been good. The first day, God created the heavens and the earth. God created light. He said it was good. The second day, actually, God didn't say it was good, and that was because that day was involved with a lot of, of uh, separation 
of elements in order to later put them together for the purpose of creation and separation and separating things from one another is not good because ultimately God wants everything to be together. But the third day, when those things started to go back together again, God said, it's good twice. And of course, the sixth day, God said, tov ma'od, very good. So all of a sudden, for the first time, there's this low tov, and we don't know where it's coming from. So off the record, because this is my thoughts, um, I've never seen this elsewhere, but I think that God was projecting. I think that God was lonely. I think that God wanted to engage with man, and man was happy as a lark and just doing his business. So God had this plan, and he said, I'll make man a partner. Not because he's lonely, because God had to actually inspire man to be lonely. God brought all the, the beasts of the earth and the, and the, and the birds of the, of the air. He brought them before man in order to you know, arouse in man this a sense that everybody else has a significant other, but he doesn't, so maybe he should have one too. So this was a big conspiracy by God. And I think that the real purpose was that God knew that you put two people together and they're much more likely to get into trouble than one person alone. So once there was man and woman, Adam v'chava, ish v'isha, they did what God seems expected would happen all along, and that was eat from the fruits. And that begins our adventure. So they ate from the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And like we discussed last night, man hid. He hid from God. He was ashamed. He said, I'm naked, and I'm ashamed, and he hid. So God, as, points, as, as it says, the voice of God strolled out into the garden, and God said, where are you? Ayeka in Hebrew, where are you? It's probably the most important question ever asked of man. And it's probably a question we, we should ask ourselves very often. Where are you? What are you doing? What are you doing in life? What's your purpose? But I'm wondering if it wasn't simply a rhetorical question or a, you know, a heads up to man. What if God really didn't see man? What if, God, what if man really hid from God? What if, man, what if God says, what does God say? Oh my God? I've created this, this world for this one purpose, for man to be with me, and he's disappeared. Imagine the angst. Imagine the, the horror that God would have felt at that moment when the crown of his creation suddenly wasn't there. When, God seemed, when man seemed to say, you want to be my friend? Well, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need you. I can do it on my own. Because... The serpent told man, told Chava, that when you eat from the fruit, you'll be like God. And God is one, and God is indivisible, and God is all-inclusive. But I think man, he saw it differently. He said, wow, if I eat from the fruit, I'll be like God. I'll be on my own. I'll be an individual. I'll be able to do my thing my way. So that was a temptation. And so man ate from the fruit and basically by doing so, man banished God from the Garden of Eden. And so all of a sudden the Garden of Eden wasn't the beautiful Garden of Eden anymore. It was a place of thorns and thistles and cursed earth and a place where you have to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. And then man discovered that he was all alone, completely alone, and he was horrified. You know, I have one of my earliest memories is learning to ride a, a bicycle, two-wheeler. At what age do people usually ride bicycles the first time? Four years, five years, six years? I was probably 10, I don't know, I was a slow learner. But I remember my father took me to the local park and we went to a grassy field, nice and flat. And I got on my bicycle and I started to pedal. And he was running alongside me with one hand on the handlebar and one hand grabbing the back of the seat. 
And I'm pedaling and going faster and faster and faster and loving it. And all of a sudden, I notice out of the corner of my eye, my dad's not there. <laughs> so I panic and I turn around. And of course, I fall down and land in the grass. And I feel naked and ashamed. Now, of course, I see my dad. He's right there. He never left me. He just wasn't holding on. He was giving me independence. But for a split second, I thought that he had left. And that was a, a sense of shame that I had that, had that thought. So here we have man and God, each one thinking that the other one walked out on him. It's a horrible situation. And man, I don't know what he was thinking. You know, maybe he saw, you know, he saw his father's car keys on the dresser and he said, okay, there's a full tank of gas. I'm going to take this out. I'm going to do my own thing. I can, I can do this on my own. And he took the car out and he crashed it and he said, oh my God, what am I going to do now? I have to face, I'm going to have to face my father. In this case, Adam, I'm going to have to face God. So the very next day on Shabbat, the day after Adam was created and the day after he ate from the fruit, he did an amazing thing. al pi Midrash, according to the Midrash, he built a misbeh, he built an altar in this very same place that he was created, the very same place where he did his misdeed. He, he and Chava, they gathered up the dirt, they gathered up the stones, they made this mass of earth, sort of a square, and they, they waved their hands and they shouted, God, we're here, we're here, it's us. In Hebrew, hineni, I'm here, here I am. And God saw them, and God must have been so completely gratified that his creation, his beloved, wanted to return and wanted to, to join up again. And there's two things remarkable about the Mizbeach, about the altar. The first thing is, it was completely man's idea. It didn't come from God. Building the altar, and of course, on the altar were offerings, but I'm not going to go into the offerings because Rabbi Richmond's going to go into the offerings a little later. There are offerings. But this was a completely man-made gesture. It wasn't a verbal gesture. It wasn't an intellectual gesture. It was completely from the heart. Now, people may say, oh, that's primitive. You know, of course it's primitive. He was the first man. So anything he did, by definition, is primitive. And immediately after, according to the Midrash, immediately after he made the altar, he sang a song of praise to God, Psalm 92, a psalm song of the Shabbat, because it was Shabbat. So even before man first put the, the pen to paper, first wrote, maybe before he even knew how to write, he built an altar. It was his first act as a human being. And this also makes me think, you know, the idea of evolution, right? So there may be a, a, some insight here. Any monkey can steal a banana and go hide up a tree and eat the banana, but it takes a man to come out of hiding and to call upon God and to say, I was wrong. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be on my own. And God, of course, was completely gratified by man's gesture. So then the next altar that we hear about, actually it's not specifically described as an altar, but the next offerings we hear about are from Cain and Abel. And their gesture is not to make amends or to, or to reunite with God, but simply to give thanks. They bring minchot, they bring gifts to God. And, of course, it doesn't go so well because one gift is, is acknowledged by God and one isn't, which prompts God to ask the next most important question ever asked of mankind, and that is, where is your brother Abel? So, as man is growing up and turning into a responsible human being, it's taking place alongside the altar. The first question, where are you, man? man ultimately answers by building an altar. And the second altar 
inspires the next question is, where's your brother? And then the third altar, which is mentioned in the Torah, is the altar built by Noah. Now, Noah is the 10th generation of man, and Noah is really the first man, the first human being who actually listens and does what God tells him to do. God gives some very, very detailed instruction as to how to make the ark, what the purpose is and what to do. And Noah follows it explicitly, successfully. The waters subside, they exit the ark. And you might think that Torah would praise Noah right now for, you know, give him a, a, a pat in the back and say, you know what, Noah, you did a good thing. You showed that you're capable of of listening, following orders, doing the right thing, but there's nothing, there's no mention, there's no reward given to Noah for having done all this. And then Noah again, just like Adam, and just like Cain and Abel, completely of his own accord, completely his own inspiration, his own idea, builds an altar and makes offerings to God. And then we, we read, that God responds, and he says, and Hashem smelled the pleasant aroma, and Hashem said to himself, I will no longer curse the earth because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will no longer smite all living things as I have done. So it said God smelled the pleasant aroma. Oh, I get it. God smelled the offerings, and it smelled great. Once again, primitive. This is primitive man. What, you know, God, man's making food for God. God's going to enjoy the food. But of course, nobody here is being primitive. And the, the, the pleasant aroma, sweet savor, it's sometimes translated. In Hebrew, it's reach nichoach, which means reach is a, a smell, an aroma. Nichoach is pleasant. Actually, it's a very beautiful verse because nichoach reflects the name Noach, whose name means comfort and pleasant. But God describes his delight, his pleasure in this offering, in this gesture. The words reach nichoach. So why is that? So again, as the rabbits in last night, she said she likes to go back to the Garden of Eden. So we're going to go back again right now to the scene of the crime. When Adam and Eve ate from the fruit of the tree, we know that the serpent spoke to, to Eve, to Chava, and told her it's a good fruit. So she heard it was a good fruit. She was tempted by her hearing, and she saw, it said that she saw that it was a good looking fruit. And so her eyesight also tempted her, and she touched the fruit, and it didn't bite back. And then they tasted the fruit. The only thing they didn't do was smell the fruit which is kind of phenomenal because smell is a very important part of taste, but they didn't smell the fruit. So the very same breath, the very same aperture through which God breathed life into man, the nose and the sense of smell, it wasn't sullied by this. All the other senses took part in eating of the fruit and going against God's will, but, but the nose, the sense of smell didn't. It, it, remained on that pure level, the pure level of creation itself when God breathed life into man through his nostrils. So, obviously God, in expressing his delight here, is going to express it as a reach nichoach, a sweet savor, a delightful smell, which is also the way it's described uh, in the book of Leviticus when describing the, the offerings uh, in the, in the uh, tabernacle, in the mishkan. And then we come to Avraham, who's 20th generation of man. And he gets, the, he gets the orders to leave Haran, and he comes into the land of Canaan. And the first place he goes in Canaan, the first place he sets his tent, uh, alone Moreh, he builds an altar. And Avraham is going to travel through the length and the breadth of the land of Israel. And everywhere he goes, he builds an altar. Now, by the time we are in the 
period of Avraham, we see that man's relationship with God has really grown up. It's not a one-dimensional relationship. It's not about a fruit in a tree. It's not about um, a couple of offerings. It's not about the, the flood. But Avraham is completely engaged with God. They talk about things like justice. They talk about they have to have decide issues of war, issues of, of rescuing captives, having children, raising children, promises, unkept promises, hopes, desires, a covenant that's going to last for generations. The whole issue of, of the Akedah, of the binding of Yitzchak, it's a very, very complex relationship now. So you might think that at this point, Abraham will say, you know what? I don't need the altar anymore. That was, that was good for then. That was good for simpler times. But Avraham insists on putting up an altar pretty much every chance he gets. So basically the altar is right there next to man and with the man every step of the way as man matures spiritually and grows into this full relationship with God. Far from being something of the distant past, it's something very contemporary. And Yitzchak also will build altars, and Yaakov will build altars, even as their relationship with God continues to grow and develop. And then we come to the 12 sons of Yaakov. And during their period, during their lifetimes, we don't read of any altars being built. And I would say that this suggests that there actually was a bit of a decline in the spiritual elevation of their time. And, and just as we learned last night that in the period of the judges, there was disunity and there was more self-interest, people were going their own way. I think it was the same thing that happened here. There was disunity, the brothers were not at all united. Read the story of Yehuda who goes off and uh, gets married and does his own thing. And everybody's kind of getting their own lives in order. And of course, that lack of unity and actual envy and rivalry uh, leads all the brothers in Egypt where they enter as these, these backwater uh, sheep herders who eat roast lamb and, and bake flatbread. And they go into this super modern, super sophisticated nation called Egypt, which really was the, the most powerful nation of the time, the most modern. And these guys are kind of hicks from the sticks. And they feel a little bit ashamed. I mean, we know when they get there, Yosef says, you know, they don't really go for shepherds here. So just uh, keep quiet about that. So they slowly lose their connection with God. They, they lose the vehicle, which has always been with them and always been their expression for calling out to God when they had the need or the desire to call out to God. And soon enough, as they assimilate into this wonderful society and become part of society and uh, start to lose a sense of who they really are, they of course end up being trapped in slavery and all of a sudden, even if they want to, they can't make an altar. They can't connect with God. And then, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, we read, Now it came to pass in those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed from the labor, and they cried out, and their cry ascended to God from the labor. God heard their cry, and God remembered his covenant with Avraham, with Yitzchak, and with Yaakov. I find it curious, it says God remembered his covenant. Does that mean that God had forgotten his covenant up to now? Just like when it says God remembered Noah. Had God forgotten about Noah? And to me, just as when God searched for man and man wasn't there, how terrifying it must have been to God. It's, I think that's the most terrifying aspect of, 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 of life when we think that God may have forgotten. You know, when Noah was doing his thing and he's on the stormy sea and there's a flood, but he knew that God was behind it, that there was a purpose and he was doing his part. 
But if you thought for a second, well, what if God forgot? What if he doesn't kick in? What if it, that's terrifying. And I think that terror is what motivated the children of Israel to cry out to God because ultimately it's when Israel cries out to God that we reconnect. Just like Adam had to cry out to God, God's there for us, but we're the ones who have to make the connection. And if we have the assumption that God is always going to be there for us, even if we do nothing about it, like he's in our back pocket, uh, it's not going to be good. So whether or not God forgets or doesn't forget, and it's interesting because there's many references in, in Psalms about God, why did you forget me? But um, just the sense that God may have forgotten us is a very horrifying existential terror. And that's what Israel's uh, suffering right now. So God hears them. And it says, God saw the children of Israel and God knew. What did God know? God knew that they were ready, that they wanted to unite again with God. And so what's God going to do? He's going to put a test to them. Now, Israel's been living abroad in the lap of luxury and having the time of their lives for an, any number of generations. And then, of course, it, it falls into slavery, which I think it's not a far cry to say that we all can fall into slavery uh, in the most advanced and, and luxurious and, and uh, exquisite societies. It's very tempting. And they literally fell into slavery and became the cogs in the machine. And so what does God propose? What does God propose to his people? He says to Moses, go back to Pharaoh and give him this question. Give him this, make this demand. And so Moses goes back to Pharaoh and he says, the Lord of the God, the Shem of the God of the Hebrews has happened upon us. Now let us go for a three days journey into the desert and offer up offerings to Hashem our God. Wow. So offer up offerings means build an altar and reach out to God. So this will be the first time in three generations that Israel either is going to have the desire or the opportunity to do this. So this, of course, leads to the exodus from Egypt, which brings us into the desert. And having left Egypt, Israel's now ready for the next stage of their relationship with God. And just give me a moment here. They meet up in the desert, and they march out to Sinai. And there, with this great show of pyrotechnics, never before seen and never before seen again, God pulls out all the stops and blesses Israel with the Ten Commandments. And these are far-reaching commandments. These are serious commandments. I am God who brought you out of Egypt, that's a commandment. Keep the Shabbat, that's a commandment. Honor your mother and your father, that's a commandment. These are all beautiful, universal commandments, and some are more easily understandable, some less so, but they definitely are God's commandments for Israel, and they're definitely life-changing, civilization-changing commandments. Now, the day that Israel received the Ten Commandments at Sinai was a Friday, Yom Shishi, the sixth day, the same day that Adam was created, and the same day that Adam ate from the fruit, the same day that Adam hid from God. So now Israel is standing at Sinai, all standing before God, 
And the Ten Commandments have just been given and people are trembling with excitement, trembling with fear. It's all new. It's all very, very, very intimidating and God is intimidating. And then God says to Moses from Exodus 20, 19 to 23, Hashem said to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, you have seen that from the heavens I have spoken with you. You shall not make images of anything that is with me. Gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me. And you shall slaughter beside it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. Wherever I allow my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. And when you make for me an altar of stones, you shall not build them of hewn stone, lest you wield your sword upon it and desecrate it. And you shall not ascend with steps upon my altar, so that your nakedness shall not be exposed upon it. Ten commandments, ten incredible challenges to man, some straightforward and immediate, some vastly far-reaching, Ten life-changing ideals, propositions, proposals to live up to and then an altar of earth you shall make for me. So what God is saying is, I love you guys. I love who you are. And remember that altar of earth you made for me way back when? Adam, remember that? That meant the world to me. And that to me is the most important thing you've ever done because that expressed your love for me, and I like that, and I want that, and I want to make that my 11th commandment, not because I'm demanding it, but because it was your idea, and I want you to know that I want you to do it. That's what really reaches me. That's what really touches me. It was your idea, it was your initiative, and that means the world to me. There's a, a saying, Rabbi Abahu ben Zera said, great is tshuva, for it preceded the creation of the world. And when Adam made his altar, he made it in the place where he had sinned. He made it of the earth of his own self. And he reached out to God. Now it's true that God had created the potential for tshuva by creating a sacred space, by creating man, by creating a line of communication, but it was man that actually filled in the missing pieces. It was man, it was Adam who reached out. What did he do? He built an altar of his own being. Let's read what, what Maimonides has to say because he actually codifies very beautifully the general rules of repentance. And in his book, Laws of Repentance, he says repentance, true tshuva. Tshuva is a return to God. It's a, it's a drawing closer to God. It's a desire of, for self-improvement. It's not necessarily a um, making amends after doing a wrong. We can do tshuva. Uh, every day, even if we're not guilty of anything, we can always improve ourselves and, and draw a little closer to God. So Maimonides says, first of all, it must come from the heart, and it must be sincere. It must be from the very essence of a person. And it's not just an expression of regret, but it's also an expression of repair, of return, of improvement. And the only true test to really show that you've achieved this is to place yourself in that same situation where you might have stumbled or you need improvement, and this time, don't stumble, but overcome what your former weakness might have been. So when Adam built his altar, he built it out of the same substance of his own being, earth. He built it in this, from the same place where he had stumbled. And by bringing offerings to it, he, he brought life to it. Basically, he was saying, you know what, what do I do? How do, how, how do I make tshuva? I want to do this. How do I do it? He didn't have Rambam. He didn't have an instruction book. 
He said, well, let me see. God created me. He took a lump of earth and he breathed life into it. So if I'm going to recreate myself as a better person, I'm going to imitate what God did. So he took this earth, made a mound of earth, brought offerings, called upon God to accept his offerings and, and breathe life into what he was doing. And again, someone might say, wow, that's primitive. That's, you know, that's almost childlike. But actually, I think it's brilliant what he did because he really created the mechanism of tshuva in a very, very basic sense. And that really is the essence of the altar. It's an expression of who we are. It's expression of what we're made of, and it's expression of what we can become, what we can achieve if we put all the elements together and, and call out to God and say, Hineni, here I am. I'm calling out to you. Lift me up. So God calls upon man at Sinai to incorporate this into the Torah itself and to make it part of man's daily service, daily relationship with God. And he says, build this altar out of earth, build it out of who you are, make a ramp without steps so that your nakedness won't be exposed. So he's saying, he's hearkening back to Adam. There's no nakedness here. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's nothing in you, even if you've done something wrong that you need to feel naked or ashamed about. There's a ramp here. That won't happen again. This altar is your gift to me, really. Man. God says to man, it's your gift to me, and my accepting your offerings is my gift to you. And that really, I believe, is the story of the altar made of Adama, earth, the same element that Adam was made of. It's an external, externalization of ourselves. And again, just like we said last night, it's not enough to say, I have a temple in here and my close, I'm close to God here. We need to get over ourselves a little. And so building an altar outside of ourselves and sort of recreating ourselves externally so we can have a good look at ourselves, just as God has a good look, look at ourselves, is, I think, the ultimate gesture of, of really reaching out and returning to God. Now, in the temple itself, where the altar ultimately stands, it's a very beautiful landscape because we have the altar which stands in the place where the tree of knowledge stood, the place where Adam was created, the place where Adam sinned, and the, the place where Adam did his tshuva, that is the place of the altar. And just west of it is the place of the foundation stone that we talked about last night, the place where God's presence is most strongest, is most powerful, is most focused on earth and from, from which it spreads forth throughout all the world and upon which rests the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant has upon it the Kruvim, the two cherubs. And if we recall, after Adam ate from the fruit of the tree of, the knowledge, of knowledge, God set these Kruvim, these two cherubim, on, around the tree of knowledge and said, this is the guard, the tree of knowledge. Now, I'm sorry, the tree of life. Now we know that the tree of life is Torah itself. And in the Ark of the Covenant are the Ten Commandments, the, the stones of the, of the commandments. So that is the place of the tree of life. And that is the tree of life. And the Kruvim, the cherubs, are those guardians of the tree of life. And just a few yards away to the east is the place where man can bear his soul can cry out to God, can reach out to God in all sorts of expressions of, of 
regret, of return, of gratitude, of thankfulness, of joy, of happiness, of togetherness, as an individual, as a family, as a nation, united, as humanity. So this sacred space that we talked about last night really comes to fruition in the Holy Temple because there is God's spot and right next to it there is man's spot, side by side. And man doesn't need to be afraid of God and God doesn't need to be terrified that man might just disappear one day. And I think that is the ultimate expression of sacred space. And it's the ultimate um, achievement of the altar that Adam first built, again, all on his own, man-made. Why does God love it so much? Because it's man's idea. If God had to command it, okay, so God loves us when we perform the things that he told us to do. But that we make a gesture unprompted I think is the absolutely most beautiful thing that we could do. And, and I think that that is the joy, that's the reach nichoach, that's the pure, pure happiness that God feels when, when we are at the altar. Now, again, this is a recreation, of course, of the Garden of Eden. But it's not going back to the Garden of Eden, it's the new Garden of Eden. It's a Garden of Eden where it's not just Adam, but it's all man, all man is invited, all the children of Adam. And so the altar is not a small one-man altar now, it's gonna be vastly different. And of this place, I just like to quote, a beautiful quote from Isaiah. I will bring them to my holy mountain, I will cause them to rejoice in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar. And God loves it so much that he's calling it his altar now, even though it's man's altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. So again, God has his place where his force, his power enters into the world, where his force and his being is most focused, and that's the Holy of Holies, and due east is the place, is man's place. The place that man sort of carved out for himself in this world, but then God sanctified it by endorsing it, by saying, I like that, it's a commandment. Call it number 11. So before we go to Rabbi Richmond, who is going to talk about the korbanot, about the offerings, and really breathe life into, I think, what I've been talking about, because again, the altar as an altar is only half of the story, um, but the offerings upon the altar is really the active ingredient that, that makes it all work, that puts it all together. I would just like to read the description, again, by Maimonides, who was a master at taking all the knowledge that came before him and ordering it and making it very accessible in the book, The Laws of the Chosen House, Hilchota Beta Bichira. Again, the chosen house harkens back to what we said last night. Chosen house refers to the holy temple and it's chosen because the God's choice, because it's that place, it's that place that God wants it to be, that place where God's ratzon, his intention is strongest. So he, in this, uh, in the book of the laws of the, of, the, of the chosen house, chapter one, Rambam begins to list the implements that are needed in the holy temple. And among them is the altar itself. And I'm just gonna read his words that are specifically referring to the altar. There's no sanctuary for all generations except in Jerusalem, specifically on Mount Moriah. As it states in 1 Chronicles 22, 1, and David declared, this is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar for the burnt offerings of Israel. 
as it states in Psalms 132.14, this is my resting place forever. The following utensils are required for the sanctuary, an altar for the burnt offering and other sacrifices, a ramp to ascend the altar. It was positioned before the entrance hall to the south, meaning the it was at its lowest point, ground level in the south, and the Kohanim would ascend the ramp heading northward, as it were. The altar should only be made as a structure of stone. Though the Torah states, Exodus 20, 24, you shall make me an altar of earth, that verse is interpreted to mean that the altar must be in contact with the earth and not build on an arch or a cave. So he's tweaking a bit with what I've said earlier. It can be built out of stone, but it has to be in direct contact with the earth, in direct contact with the source of Adam, with the source of our physical being. That's essential. And then he continues. Though it states if you make an altar of stone, the oral tradition explains that the matter is not left to our decision, but is an obligation to come in upon us. So he's saying that even though in Exodus, God sort of words it, if you make an altar of stone, because again, God is saying, it was your gesture, it's your idea, I, that's what I love about it. I love the spontaneity of bringing offers. Still, once God said I love it, it becomes an obligation. Any stone which is damaged to the extent that a nail will become caught in it uh, when passing over it, uh, as a nail could become caught in the slaughtering knife, which has to be so smooth and sharp that, that it won't snag on anything, it's disqualified for use in the altar or the ramp. As it states in Deuteronomy 27.6, you shall build the altar of the Lord with whole stones. So again, the stones, as he'll continue to explain, have to be untouched untouched by man. Again, parale paralleling the source of Adam, which was from a pure source, untouched. From where would they bring the stones of the altar? From virgin earth. They would dig it until they reached the point where it was obviously never used for tilling or for building, and they would take the stones from there. Alternately, they would take them from the Mediterranean Sea and build with them. Each stone which was touched by iron, even though it was not damaged, is disqualified for use in building the altar or the ramp, as it is said in Exodus 20:25. 20, by lifting your sword against it, you will have profaned it. So again, the altar, the stones can't be touched or tainted by anything that might even hint at violence, anything that might hint at, at anything but life, because it's ultimately all about life. Anyone who builds the altar or the ramp with a stone that has been touched by iron violates a negative command and is given lashes. As it is said, do not build them with hewn stone. One who builds with a damaged stone violates a positive commandment. If a stone was damaged or touched by iron once it had been built into the altar or the ramp, that stone alone is invalidated, but the others are still fit for use. This recalls uh, going back, back into the into, into Genesis, you know, after Adam and after Cain and Abel, we uh, were told about Yuval and Tuval Cain. And it says that Yuval was the father of all who grasp a lyre and a flute. And Tuval Cain, Tuval Cain, who sharpened all tools that cut copper and iron. So again, I'm, I'm going back again to ancient history, uh, but in the generation of Yuval and Tuvalkain, who were brothers, mankind entered into, I guess what we'd call today civilization. Tuvalkain, uh, Yuval is really the father of the arts, music, artistic creation, maybe leisure time, expression, artistic expression, and Tuvalkain, who discovered how to make metals. He was really the father of industry, the father of agriculture, 
father of weaponry, of technology, all these things that describe civilization as we know it today. But way before that, again, was the altar. So once again, man's call out to God, man's reaching out to God, man's making of himself something better so that he can elevate himself toward God way predated any other sign of civilization. And it was, again, the first, very first act of humanness, the very first act of being a ben adam, as we say in Hebrew, meaning a human being, even though the first person to do it was actually Adam himself. So I'm going to jump back ahead. So, so again, Maimonides is describing the... Uh, the isor, the, the uh, forbidden, forbiddenness of touching any stone on the altar either before it, being, it was being built or after it was built with, with any implement of metal. They coated the altar with cement or, or plaster twice a year, before Pesach and before Sukkot. When they coated it, they used a cloth rather than an iron lathe, lest it touch a stone and invalidate it. We must not make steps for the altar, as in Exodus 22, 26 states, do not ascend on my altar with steps. Rather, we must build an incline on the southern side of the altar, diminishing in height as it declines from the top of the altar until the earth. It was called the ramp, in Hebrew, the kevish. Again, a smooth ramp, as I said in Exodus, so that your nakedness wouldn't be exposed. And again, it seems to me that that is God reaching out to the Adam and all of us that said, oh, we were naked and we hid. God is saying, there's no shame here, there's no nakedness here. It's all above board, it's, it's all open. Anyone who ascends the altar with steps violates a negative command and is given lashes. Similarly, anyone who demolishes a single stone from the altar, any part of the temple building or the floor of the temple courtyard between the entrance hall and the altar with a destructive intent is worthy of lashes. As it states in Deuteronomy 12, 3, 4, uh, 3 and 4, you shall destroy their altars. Do not do so to God, to, 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 to God your, your God. Now, I'm going to continue reading from Rambam and from chapter 2 of the Law of the Chosen House. And this is, entire, is, is dedicated in its entirety to the altar. The altar is to be constructed in a very precise location, which may never be changed. As it is said in Chronicles 2.22.1, this is the altar for the burnt offerings of man. That precise place is the precise place where Adam, or man, was created and it can't be built anywhere else. And today, when we build an altar, someday, God willing, it'll have to be in that very, very same, very precise place. And, it's, and he continues to, to, to say, Yitzhak was prepared as a sacrifice, as an offering on the temple's future site. As it says in Genesis 22, 2, go to the land of Moriah, and in Chronicles 11, 3, 1, it is said, then Solomon began to build the house of Hashem in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where Hashem appeared to David, his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And he continues, it is universally accepted that the place in which David and Solomon built the altar, the threshing floor of Ornan, is the location where Avraham built the altar on which he prepared Yitzchak for sacrifice. Is Hillel here? Recall last night Hillel read from the Waqf guidebook to the Temple Mount, and he pointed out that they say this is the universal, universally acknowledged place of the altar and of the temple. I find it very ironic that, uh, that they are actually echoing what, what Maimonides said uh, almost eight centuries earlier. Uh, it says, and I, and I have the same quote that, that Tillo quoted last night. We didn't discuss this ahead of time. But I'll, I'll read it again, because I think it's just so sweet. It says in the, in the Waqf book, 
the Waqf guidebook, the Muslim Waqf guidebook to the Temple Mount. The two principal edifices on the, are the Dome of the Rock on a raised platform in the middle and the Mosque of, of Al-Aqsa against the south wall. Other buildings which we shall consider later lie dotted about there, about there and there. On the left, along the east wall, the double portal of the Golden Gate appear. On every side, trees break the prospect, which lend a particular charm to the scene. The site is one of the oldest in the world. Its sanctity dates back from the earliest, perhaps prehistoric times. Its identity with the site of Solomon's temple is beyond dispute. This, too, is the spot, according to the universal belief, on which, quote, David built there an altar unto Hashem and offered burnt offerings from Samuel 24, 25. I think that's amazing that the Muslim waqf basically quoted Rambam. Um, they're great guys. They're doing a lot for temple consciousness in our generation, the Muslim waqf. We should be very grateful. Um, and Rambam continues, Noah built an altar in that location. When he left the ark, it was also the place of the altar in which Cain and Abel brought sacrifices. Similarly, Adam, the first man, offered a sacrifice there and was created on that very spot. As our sages said, man was created from the place where he would find atonement. Now, Rambam describes the place as being, the, the, the site of the altar as being in a very precise location. In Hebrew, that's, that is, makom hamukuvan bioter, meaning, a very precise location. Mukuvan, from the Hebrew kivun, direction, like east, west, north, south, or directions, kivunim. So the place of the altar is the place that is most mukuvan, most precisely located that there is. But there's also another meaning to kivun, mukuvan. It's related to the word kavana, which means intention. So I would suggest a second understanding of what Rambam is saying here, that it's the most intended place on earth, that it's the place that God most intended for man to be man. That's the place where man was created from. That's the place where man stumbled, and that's the place where man stood up again and atoned, and that's the place where man will continue to express his desire for closeness to Hashem. So that is the place most intended by God, by God for man to be. Again, God's here? Yes, of course God's here. I have a temple here? Okay, if you say so. But this place, this location, this is where God always intended for man to be at his finest, at his best, to be the most man that he could be, right here at the altar. Maimonides continues, the dimensions of the altar must be very precise. Its design has been passed down from one to another over the course of the generations. The altar built by the exiles, the, returning, the returnees from Babylon, was constructed according to the design of the altar to be built in the Messianic age. We may not increase or reduce its dimensions. Three prophets returned to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, with the people. One attested to the site of the altar, the second to its dimensions, and the third attested to the halakha permitting all offerings to be offered on that altar, even though the temple itself was not yet built. So the altar is such an important structure, it's such an important element of our relationship with God that even before the temple itself is built, it's incumbent upon us to build an altar and to begin the offerings. The three prophets Maimonides uh, are referring to are, of course, Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. And the altar constructed by Moses, and similarly then built, that built by Solomon, and that erected by the returning exiles, and that to be built in the Messianic age are all 10 cubits high, approximately five meters, which is about uh, five and a half yards, I guess. Five and a half yards, that's two stories high, basically. There's a massive altar in the Holy Temple. Though the, story, the Torah states in Exodus 27, its height will be three cubits, which is lower, that refers to the surface upon which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged. 
The length and breadth of the altar built by the returning exiles, and similarly the one to be built in the Messianic age, is 32 cubits by 32 cubits. That's approximately 16 by 16 meters. That's referring to the top surface of the altar. Now this is huge. And when the Kohanim would go up the ramp with offerings, barefoot, without steps, it must have been a huge effort. And rain or shine, in, in the hottest summer, in the coldest winter, and they ascended very high, and there were no guard railings around the altar. This is serious stuff. This is very, very serious. The 10 cubits of the altar's height were not measured in a consistent manner. Sometimes the measure of a cubit was six hand breaths, while in other cases, the cubit's measure was five hand breaths. In all other cases, the cubits mentioned to the dimensions of the temple are six hand breaths. That's a detail. The height of the entire altar was 58 hand breaths. Just another way of, of measuring it. The altar's dimensions and designs were as follows. Five hand breaths up and five hand breaths uh, from a step called the base, the yesod. Thus, the remaining area of the altar was 30 cubits and two hand breaths by 30 cubits and two hand breaths. 30 hand breaths further up and five hand breaths further up is called the surrounding ledge, the sovev. So the altar was basically two-tiered, and the second tier was slightly smaller than the first tier, halfway up the total height. And that was a sort of a passageway around the altar that the Kohanim uh, would walk around uh, when it was time to uh, sprinkle the blood on the altar in different locations. Thus, its area was 28 cubits and four hand breaths by 28 cubits and four hand breaths. Go up, eight, up 18 hand breaths, place a hollow, a rectangular structure in each corner of this surface. Those are the four horns of the altar. The altar has to have in each of the four corners of its top surface, these squares of a certain dimension. Without that, it's not an altar. The area encompassed by the horns was one cubit by one cubit on all sides. Similarly, the space for the priest to walk was a cubit on all sides. Thus, the surface on which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged was 24 cubits and four hand breasts by 24 cubits and four hand breasts. Each of the four horns was five hand breasts high. The area of each horn was a cubit by a cubit. All four horns were hollow. Thus, the, surround, the surface on which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged was 18 hand breasts above the surrounding ledge. Half of the altar's height began six hand breasts below the, the end of the surrounding ledge. A scarlet band, sikra, is girdled, girded around the middle of the altar. It was a red band painted to mark halfway up the altar. Six hand breasts below the surrounding ledge to separate between the, the blood to, to be cast on the upper portion of the altar and the blood to be sprinkled on the lower portion of the altar. Thus, the distance from the earth to the surface on which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged was a hand breadth less than nine cubits. The ledge, sovev, encircled the altars on all four sides. The base, yesod, did not. The base, the yesod, encompassed the entire northern and western sides of the altar and consumed one cubit on the south side and one cubit on the east side. Thus, the southeastern corner of the altar did not have the base. This base, this yeso to the altar, is very, very important. There were two holes in the southwest corner of the altar's base, resembling two thin nostrils. I find it's very interesting that Maimonides refers to these as resembling nostrils. Again, Adam saw the, the, the altar as being a recreation of himself, a reworking of himself to try to improve and try to better himself. And it was through the nostrils that God breathed life into him. And the altar itself has these two nostril-like uh, holes in, in the, in the asod, in the, in the base. These two thin nostrils were called shitin. The blood which was poured on the altar would run off through them and be mixed together in the drainage canal in that corner. From there, it would flow out to the Kidron Valley. Below, in the floor of the corner of the altar was a place, a cubit by a cubit, covered by a block of marble with a ring affixed to it. They would ascend there to the sheetine and clean them. So sometimes they would get clogged up and they would have to periodically clean uh, this passageway so that the, they could continue to uh, pour the blood through. 
The ramp, Kevish, was constructed to the south of the altar. Its length was 32 cubits, and its width 16 cubits. Again, a cubit is uh, an amma, and it's about half of a meter, so we're talking about, about 16 meters long and 8 meters wide. It consumed 30 cubits on the ground adjacent to the altar and extended further covering one cubit on the base and one cubit of the surrounding ledge. There was a small space between the ramp and the altar so that the limbs of the sacrifices would have to be tossed to reach the altar. The height of the ramp was nine cubits minus a sixth of a cubit equal to that of the surface on which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged. Two small ramps extended from it, one led to the base and the other to the surrounding ledge. They were set off from the altar by a hair's breadth. There was an aperture to the west of the ramp, a cubit by a cubit, it was called the Rivuva. There, fowl that had been disqualified for use as sin offerings would be placed until their form decomposed, at which time they could be taken out to be burnt. Two tables were placed on the left of the ramp. Anyone who's familiar with the, the pictures, the paintings of the Temple Institute, some of our books, you might recognize some of the things that are being described here. And uh, this is, is really the source of, of, of this information um, based on earlier sources. One of silver, on, on one of marble in which the limbs of the sacrifices to be offered on the altar were placed, and one of silver on which sacrifice of vessels were placed. When we build the altar, it must be made as one solid block resembling a pillar. No empty cavity may be left at all. Some people question whether Maimonides really thought there would be offerings in the future, because he says in the, in the, in, in the Guide for the Perplexed that it was sort of a process of, of weaning Israel away from, from, uh, from paganism. But he says right here, when we build the altar, and of course he states very, very clearly in, in another place that uh, when his philosophical thoughts contradict a halakha, then always the halakha is, is what's, is what's kove, it's what it's what rules out in the end. And he makes it very clear, when we build the altar, it must be as one solid block re resembling a pillar. No empty cavity may be left at all. We must bring whole stones, both large and small. Then we must create a liquid with lime, pitch, and molten. There's a whole art. There's a whole science to building an altar. We must create a liquid with lime, pitch, and molten lead and pour it over the stones into a large mold of its dimensions. We must build it in this manner, ascending level by level. We must place a block of wood or, st or stone in the southwest, southeast corner of the structure equal to the measure of the missing portion of the altar's base. Similarly, blocks must be placed in each horn until the building is completed. Then the blocks must, may be removed from the structure, thus leaving the southeast corner without a base and the horns hollow. He's giving very technical instructions now how to build an altar. The four horns, the base, and a square shape are absolute requirements for the altar. Any altar with, which lacks either a horn, a base, or a ramp, or a square shape is unfit for use for these four are absolute requirements. However, the measure of length, width, and height are not absolute requirements, provided that they are not less than a cubit by a cubit in area and three cubits high. The latter were the dimensions of the surface on which the wood for the sacrifices was arranged uh, for the altars in the sanctuary that accompany the Jews in the desert. The following laws apply when the structure of the altar is damaged. If a handbreadth of its structure is damaged, it is unfit for use. If less than a handbreadth is damaged, it is acceptable, provided none of the remaining stones are damaged. And thus concludes Maimonides' description of the altar. And he just mentioned the measurements of length, width, and height are not absolute. It can be smaller than these dimensions that he's just given us. And the Temple Institute has actually made a, a, an altar that fulfills this description, all these requirements, which is smaller, but large enough to fulfill the requirements to make it a kosher, uh, a, a kosher altar. And um, one day when the opportunity arises, that altar can actually be disassembled and brought up to the Temple Mount and reassembled. And again, it's really the first step, um, even before the building of the Temple, um, even before we, we re-sanctify that area where God's presence rests and is most strongest, we're instructed to first go to the area reserved for man and begin the offerings. So if I focus my talk 
on the spiritual origins and meanings and concept of the altar and in the history of the altar. And now I've just quoted Maimonides, very detailed description of the physical structure of the altar uh, of the Holy Temple. But again, the physical structure of the altar, whether it's a small one-man altar or the massive temple altar, it's just that, it's a physical mass. But when the offerings are brought and when a person is there standing next to the altar, this massive altar, this two-story altar, and the Kohanim are there performing precisely according to their obligations, and the Levites are making music, and the smoke, the flames of the altar are rising, and the pillar of smoke is going up to heaven. It must be an incredibly compelling experience. In this case, it involves all the senses, including smell, because this is the altar. And it must be an incredibly humbling experience to be by the altar and to see the, the effort being made, the Kohanim walking up basically two flights of a ramp, barefoot, and these fires set on the top of the altar. I can only imagine in my mind's eye uh, what it was what it was like, what it will be like. You know, the Torah is all about asiya, all about doing things, all about experiencing, experiencing life. And you can't describe to someone what Shabbat's all about. You just don't know until you experience Shabbat. And you can't describe really what keeping kosher is about until you do it, until you've tried it. And then you say, ah, oh, now I get it. And of course, it's the same with an altar with offerings. Um, I've tried to convey some of the, what I believe is the real basic significance, the reason why it's so important to God that there's an altar. And again, it's because it came from here. It came from man, and it was man's gesture, and it was man's return to God, and it was man's saying, Hineni, I'm here, I'm here, God. I want your attention. I'm here. I want to be part of the game. I want to be in. I want to be your partner in all this. And I think that is the underlying message of the altar. And Rabbi Richmond will now tell us more about the offerings themselves and really bring this all to life. And hopefully complete the experience, at least in our mind's eye, of the offerings in the Holy Temple. Thank you.